It is that time of the week again when we review all of the ways in which the media covers themselves in glory. And to do exactly that, we have host of the Katie Helper Show and co-host of the Useful Idiots podcast, Katie Helper herself. Great to see you, Katie. You too. Um, so resistance hero governor Andrew Cuomo has a new award and accolade to add to his many glowing reviews that he received from mainstream media, which is he won an Emmy, an Emmy. And here's what they said. Governor Cuomo of New York will receive the International Emmy Founders Award in recognition of his leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic and his masterful use of TV to inform and calm people around the world. Um, Katie, your thoughts. Well, I actually thought that it was a really good decision to give him an Emmy, but I think the Emmy should be for best performance, um, best dramatic performance uh, under a pandemic. And because uh, I think his acting chops are really good. Uh, he's very good at basically, you know, I, not to put too fine a point on it, but I think his lying uh, is a form of acting. And people may remember um Although you see, the thing about him is he's a much better liar than Trump is. Right. So everyone knows that Trump is lying. But Cuomo is much more of a kind of um, a realist in his acting skills. So he, of course, lied about nursing homes, which he forced to let in patients from hospitals. Also, he gave nursing homes a deal with the immunity to protect his basically his donors. Um, and when confronted about that, he just called it a conspiracy theory. Yeah. I mean, so I that think, alone, I think that in a alone, way. Yeah. It is sort of appropriate in a way. Like, it's ridiculous and absurd, obviously. But the thi- people love those freaking press conferences when oh, he yeah. just got out there with his, like, big government, daddy's got this under control yeah. energy. And even as he was making terrible decisions and waited too long to shut down and has some ridiculous beef with Bill de Blasio that undermines everything and, like, undercuts everything that they're doing. And obviously the unconscionable decisions regarding nursing homes that probably sentenced to death thousands of elderly yeah. New Yorkers. Like, all of the substance was really bad, but right. what he's getting this for is the press conferences, and people did the really fucking love those press conferences. Yeah, it's the performance. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. And also, I mean, I, I feel like he should also get some kind of National Arts Award for his poster <laughs> about uh, about the way that he flattened the curve. So, yeah. yeah, I think it's a great decision. As long as we know that it's for dramatic performance, then I think it's very appropriate. Yeah, um, very true. Award. I mean, this guy's yeah. just amazing. Like, he's... There, the pandemic is still going on, and if you know that, um, I think that's no. probably, like, it's out of control. It's worse than it's ever been. There's a right. surge in New York. They had to shut schools down again, which is a whole other issue. You freaked out about even getting asked a question about that. And this guy already wrote a book, a, like, mission-accomplished book, and put out his We Did It poster about coronavirus. It's kind of incredible, honestly, to behold. Um, and didn't as- he blame other people for the he, he, he actually said, right, that the, the spike was the fault of people not wearing masks, just like people who have weight problems. It's their fault for eating cheesecake. Did you see this? No, I missed that one. Yeah, well, we'll have you'll have to put that in post or we'll have to do an, another segment on it. But it's <laughs> incredible. But I also I do feel like Donald Trump deserves a best supporting actor role. OK, uh, best supporting actor Emmy, because without him, you know, Cuomo. Cuomo's entire performance was really based on not being Trump. That's true. Right? Like if he, without all he had to do was say stuff that was not put bleach into your lungs. Right. And he looked like he had <laughs> so much good. gravitas. Yeah. <laughs> That's very true. So he should share the Emmy with Trump. Or maybe with his brother who would, like, put him on TV and ask him, you know, it's how, true. tell me more about how incredible you are and what a, like, That's great job you're They should definitely York. share it. Or, but I, you know what I think that he... It would be great if we could do an expose into who was really the mom's favorite. I don't think it could be Andrew. So I think <laughs> he deserves another uh, award for that. <laughs> for not being, for overcoming not being mom's favorite. Yeah, and for pretending to be mom's favorite. Uh, um, while, while Chris Cuomo is much more credible in that role. <laughs> um, another thing that I think caught both of our eye, eye this week. Okay, so we got a lot of Biden cabinet picks many of them with an array of conflict of interest and various problematic views and past positions and, you know, horrible roles in creating the terrible hellscape of foreign policy that we have. So um, Tony Blinken is someone that we've been talking about here on this show for a long time as a potential contender for the Biden cabinet, in large part because of the work that they did at American Prospect exposing him and Michelle Flournoy and some of the ties that they have directly to private equity firms, but more uh, significantly defense industry contractors. 
So David Dayen tweets out, read what Blinken did in between the Obama and Biden administrations, getting rich working for corporate clients at a pop-up strategic consultancy, which uh, Vox editor Aaron Rupar quote tweeted and said, Blinken participated in society, the horror, which is just like, you know, the thing that drives me the most crazy about DC is that things that should be completely like beyond the pale and out of bounds, like having a direct financial interest in some of the policies that you will be executing on, like things that should be direct, obvious corruption and out of bounds are just considered, considered like, yeah, that's how things work around here. What are you complaining about? Yeah, it's almost stunning. I, I mean, I feel like I live in a constant state of, can you believe that? Oh, yes, I can. All these things should be shocking, but they really, I'm naive at this point to be shocked by it. Uh, but I'm almost appreciative of it because, you know, whereas we have Andrew Cuomo uh, showing off his dramatic chops, in a way, there's a, like a brutal honesty to this. I mean, I think it comes from a total lack of awareness and being totally out of touch um, and insular and extremely, um, really just a, a snob filled with contempt and um, insensitivity. But the fact that this person, and I can't, I think I, I blocked it out that he was an editor. I was pretending he was just a reporter, not that that's okay either. But the fact that you would say out loud, he participated in society, the horror, and you're dismissing and sanitizing all this corruption. And all this, the exact type of behavior, by the way, that alienates people and turns people off from politics and will make people not want to vote for someone, um, as long as you're not Trump, again, you get a free, like, I think if, if Trump, Trump could put one fewer kid in cages, and if you tried to criticize him for that, sorry, I said Trump, Freudian slip, Biden, if Biden put one fewer kid in a cage than Trump did, and anyone said anything about it, people like Rupar would be like, wow. Really? But Trump. I mean, that's yep. their only standard. Yep. And honestly, it's really offensive because um, Blink, uh, Lincoln, Blinken and Flournoy made uh, had huge roles in foreign policy when they were working for Obama, uh, which included for Blinken basically greenlighting Mohammed bin Salman uh, and the war against Yemen. And to, to hear someone like dismiss his role in that the horror like i want him to actually look some yemeni family in the face or some yemeni parents who have lost their kids in the face and tell them to get over it it's just it's like it's really incredible and, and i know I, I try to sometimes be funny i can't really think of anything funny here which is maybe appropriate because we're talking about genocide but it's like how how disgusting is it that you say that this is the type of stuff you say either in your head or at like a dinner party yeah but not in writing for uh prosperity yeah and that's the thing is that this is just accepted. Like, this is just the way things work. I mean, it sort yeah. of does remind me of the conversation that we had around Hunter Biden and earning all this money on Ukrainian exactly. boards and, you know, getting yeah. sweetheart Chinese loans and all this stuff. And the number of people here who genuinely, I think genuinely, authentically couldn't understand why that was a problem. Like, yeah. beyond, they'd be like, well, it's not illegal. It's like, well, is that your only right. standard standard yeah. of morality? First of all, it should be illegal. Let's start there. But second yeah. of all, that's your only standard of morality is like if it's technically legal, even if it's obviously extraordinarily corrupt on its face and he's trading on his dad's name and, you know, other family members have done the same. Like, oh, this is all fine. This is what everyone do here does. So what are you right. making such a big deal out of this for? Well, I think there's two. That's one standard. And the other standard is it's not Trump. It's the but Trump or look at Trump's kids standard. Right. And I think that Democrats like came really close to letting that. I mean, obviously, Biden won. But look, we lost some House seats and we're probably going to, you know, still not have the Senate. And Biden won by a lot. But honestly, Trump got more votes than he should have. And I don't think would have won unless there had been the pandemic. I mean, sorry, I would have lost. This is like a sign of how much I see them as a continuation of the same system <laughs> with different with different with different affects. But that's not a sustainable position. Like people start seeing through that. And it's also not good for Biden. I mean, as like the fourth estate does have a potential role in pushing. I mean, it hasn't for so long. Who am I kidding? But, you know, it, it doesn't do Biden any favors to totally enable and coddle him because uh, as I guess it does, as long as they're consistent and do that on a full time basis so that the people can't actually know the truth. But, you know, there's some things that just have to come out. And when when that stuff comes out and you have journalists just writing blank checks for these people, it 
it comes out that that person is full of it and that Biden is full of it. And I think it erodes the very already eroded trust that we have in institutions like the media and the presidency. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. This guy's job is supposed to be to hold power accountable, like not yeah. to excuse them, not to, you know, look the other way, not to pretend like these problems don't exist. Like he's supposed to be the one, one of the people who's like digging into what those relationships are and explaining whether they're an issue or whether they're not an issue, just dismissing them out of hand instead and like playing yay, go team blue is yeah. exactly why there's so much disgust and distrust with the media. And look, from a progressive standpoint, how many times did we get told like, hold your fire until election day. And then the moment we beat Trump, it's, you know, it's game on and all your criticisms are fair game. Of course, we always knew that would never be the case. You are never right. allowed to expose the Democratic Party. You're never allowed to critique them. They can only fit like they can never fail. Basically, they can never do them. any wrong because yeah. they're not Trump, because the Republicans right. are an iota worse. Yeah, and we fail them and democracy when we when we don't continue to say that basically, even though Trump is gone. And I mean, what I'm really looking forward to is when Trump is packed up and you know in Mar-a-Lago or whatever he does. You know, he said he was going to leave the country. I have this in interesting image in my head of him and and uh, Mike Pence, Thelma and Louise style, driving off into the sunset. A bit of a happier <laughs> ending than than Thelma and Louise, but. Um, it, yeah, it's just incredible. Like, I want to know when we have if, if people like Rupar could just send us like a, a timeline of when it's OK to actually talk about what the president is doing once it's Biden, because it's going to be before it was during the primary. We couldn't. Um, then during the general, we definitely couldn't. And now that he's been uh elected we still can't because he just got there crystal he just got there let him get into office first let him do all these decisions make all these decisions now and then and then because obviously he's so receptive to us as we've seen mm. that we can just readdress it later there's no need you know to talk about it now we saw we talked about this last week with the um sunrise movement uh having the audacity to criticize uh someone who biden named who is terrible on climate change. And you had Jonathan Martin at the New York Times, who's white, by the way, coming in to chide them, an organization made up of a lot of people of color, by the way. And he came in to chide them for um, being so unappreciative, I guess, for of this picking, guy. Picking a black. fight with the Biden Picking a fight from the beginning, from the get-go. Because we all know you shouldn't pick a fight from the get-go. You should make sure that the guy, you know, give him a couple of years to, to condemn the, the earth to fiery explosion and internal damnation <laughs> or whatever happens because of climate change. Like, give them a few years to do that. And then if you still think that the, that the planet should, deserves to be around, then present, then set up a commission, write up a report, and send it to him and see how he responds. That's right, how you and quietly, do quietly, like, you know, in a closed setting with no yeah. press, so no one knows right. about it, you know, between yeah. in the family. Uh, that's the in appropriate the family, way right. to handle this, I guess. Right, yeah. like John Favreau said, you keep it keep it in the family, right? And, and also, I just want to give a shout out, though. I, I have to say, this whole apologia of, um, of Biden and of Blinken, I got to give a shout out to Samantha Power, because she really is bringing the humanity back into politics. Uh, she tweeted about Blinken, can't let this get lost. The next U.S. Secretary of State is a new dad. It will be inspiring for working parents everywhere to see America's top diplomat in action, as he also helps raise two toddlers. Thanks to Tony and the incomparable Evan Ryan for their family sacrifice. Aww. So, guys, <laughs> you know why I'm so excited about Tony Blinken? Because I'm so tired of seeing men forced to stay at home while they raise their kids, mm. while women go back to work. It's like, this doesn't even, what does this even mean? It's like, it's so crazy on multiple levels, because number one, it's like, this isn't a thing that's a problem for guys of like being able to keep working right. while their kids are young and at home, whereas it is for women, obviously. Right. But then on the other, but then you're also delving into this like the hollowest, thinnest read of identity politics you could possibly oh, no. imagine. It's, it's so hollow. Great. And if I read one more analysis of how diverse Joe Biden's cabinet is going to be without yeah. one word or mention of what their policies and our ideas are, like, we had just had an entire election where the whole nation was like, where a large swath of minority voters was like, we don't care that yeah. Kamala Harris will be the first black woman right. vice president. We're looking at policies. We're looking at what this right. means for our lives. Like, it's never been more clear, but they just yeah. can't help 
but do this thing over and over and over again, thinking that it's somehow progressive or means something in terms of policy when we've seen over and over again, it doesn't. Right. I mean, yeah, Kamala Harris was very good at locking up black people. So if you want to talk about identity politics, like we should look at the identities of the victims of these people's policies. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's just absurd. It's ridiculous. We, I actually had on my show the other day, Branya Kalik and Brianna Joy Gray, um, and we we coined the term woke washing, which mm. is what Biden, the Biden administration is is definitely doing. Um, and you see it overtly. I mean, you saw it in this article in the Hill, um, in Political or the Hill, I can't remember, but Gregory Meeks was suggesting that it was, you know. Uh, mutually exclusive to pursue a diverse cabinet and pursue a cabinet that didn't have people from uh, Wall Street on it. I mean, again, saying this stuff out loud as if it's not the most either disingenuous or insulting thing to say about it. Right. And uh, it, it's really offensive. Uh, power, by the way, I mean, I almost like this new this new genre of identity politics. It's just based on like like parental status, I guess. Right. <laughs> I, I, I get some points here. Better. I mean, I've got three kids, yeah. so this is good for me. You know what? I should sue. As someone with no kids, I'm offended. I feel <laughs> invisibilized, and this is erasure. This is erasure. Katie, great to see you. Thanks, Crystal. Hey. And we'll have more rising for you after this. <laughs> 